So our final presentation of this section today um, is on the studentness penalty. Um, we've got Mia Zong and do we have Rachel Cohen as well? No, it's Mia Zong. Um, so shall I give the description about Rachel as well for information? <laughs> Has she both, both worked on the research? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Rachel Cohen, who's not here today, is a Professor of Sociology, Work and Employment at City University. Rachel is a sociologist with expertise in gender, non-standard work, work-life boundaries, body work, occupational identity and feminist quantitative analysis. She convenes the British Sociological Association's work, Employment and Economic Life study group and is a member of the Gender and Sexuality Research Centre and Centre for Research on Work and Society. And we've got Mia here today, who's a postdoctoral researcher at City University London, who and her interests lie in family work, gender, and social networks. So, welcome. Okay. 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 Good afternoon. Thank you for um, having us today. I'm very honoured to be uh, representing my team to present um, this work from our project, which is a uh, ESRC-founded research project called Learning, Rethinking Young Women's Working Life. And the results and analysis that I'm presenting today are from Work Package 1, which is um, more about the quantitative analysis um, of this project. So the context of our whole project comes from an um, both empirical and theoretical urgency to better understand student employment in the UK, uh, not only because it's increasingly becoming more commonplace in this country and also worldwide, but also because students are facing increasingly more um, serious dual, uh, dual crisis that consists of living, cost of living crisis and also learning crisis. And um, theoretically, we understand that scholars uh, in the fields of labor market, employment, youth study, education, we've long seen students as future workers. That is to say there is this transition in people's life where people move from being in education to being in the labor market. So this transition from studying to working makes working as a very peripheral um, temporal activity that young people experience when they're still studying. Um, and early earning while learning has always been viewed in um, binary terms that is either a good thing for students to better prepare for their future careers or it's, um, it's, um, it's a hindrance to young people's academic performance, well-being in school life, um, that we think need more uh, new ones and some new theorizations around um, students working. The contribution of our whole project on students' employment, um, it, it comes from our analysis from um, national uh, UK survey data sets as well as face, uh, focus group interviews with young women and we would like to um, make our statement that earning while learning is a significant instead of a marginal part of students life and uh, we found uh, evidence for a large concentration of students workers in low paid sectors and insecure work at the same time we found gendered patterns of working tendencies as well as hours um, and also employment profiles at early ages and our um, qualitative, um, the qualitative study of our project found out that earning while learning um, has much more meaning than just getting payment for um, sustaining one's life. It, it means um, self-value and it has it is important for young women's sense of relationships themselves and also in terms of understanding what it means to be a worker and what life will be when they fully enter the labor force market. Young women workers experience early exposure to gendered and sexual harassment, ageism and disrespect during their earning while learning experiences. 
and also this is an important socialization process for them when they are moving through this uh, transition and life course. So we are proposing um, a theoretical lens to look at student work um, and early employment um, as working life course instead of just seeing uh, working as something very uh, peripheral in young people's lives. So the quantitative analysis that I'm presenting today come from um, the data sets that, main, that we mainly rely on um, annual population survey data. We, um, we selected the survey data from years 2005, 2010, 15, 19, and 22 in an effort to cover some critical um, moments, and including the raise of student fee, Brexit, and COVID-19. Um, to give you an idea of the sample that we're looking at, so from APS 2022, we have about 6,600 full-time students from all the sample, and um, about 2,022 of them reported that they are being in employment as their main um, economic activities. Uh, to provide some extra support um, evidence for our, um, for our results, we also combined the data sets from um, Labor Force Survey quarterly data set for 2022, as well as a uh, student survey data, um, mainly about what happened to students during COVID. Um, it's called Cosmo. Uh, we use the data that are available at Wave 1. The variable that we looked at to map out what students are doing in terms of working, um, can, including whether they are in paid employment or not, their working hours, um, the hourly pay they received, which is a derived variable provided by the data set, um, the three-digit level occupation information, industry information, and also um, we group different occupations to four categories in terms of the gender composition of this, uh, of this occupation group. So uh, female dominant or male dominant occupations are the ones that have more than 65.9% um, of female or male students in that group. And we also have small group occupations, which, can, which is only reported by one or two students, that saying that they're working in these kind of um, uh, rarely seen occupations. And also um, the rest are integrated ones. That means that they have roughly closer share of female and male workers in that group. So I'm presenting all the results from those three um, parts. The first one is a mapping out of the employment profile of uh, student workers today. And then we will go into discuss the more gender segregation occupations among student workers. And then we talk about um, what they are receiving um, in terms of payment as a labor force. So the first uh, important findings of our analysis is that women, uh, female students, are more likely to work than male students. This uh, result um, is consistent across data sets. So on the uh, top panel is uh, the likelihood to work for female and male students for um, the year 12 students from the Cosmo survey data. And the lower panel shows um, the differences, uh, the gender difference in terms of likelihood to work um, for full-time students working um, from APS 2022. There are two things uh, notable here. The first one is that this likelihood to work is much lower than some uh, studies and reports using um, student income and expenditure survey as well as some administrative linked data, uh, which, which is about 70% of students are engaged in paid employment over two tax years. Um, we think the reason why we're capturing our smaller share is that um, we, the, data, the variables that we're using does not include some more informal work like babysitting, um, seasonal work, or uh, summer work, summer jobs. So that's why we are seeing a lower percentage here. Um, another, um, another thing to note is that the differences between gender at both panel is actually more, um, is, is larger than the differences between the likelihood to work between students in um, 
private schools versus public schools, and also um, the, larger than the differences between students from London and students from um, elsewhere. So, um, so the first takeaway message from our analysis is that women, female students are more likely to work than male students while they are studying. And this pattern is also consistent across age groups. So um, we divided the four panels by, uh, by four age groups. And also we mapped them across the years from 2010 to 2022. And we can see that female student continuously consistently to have higher likelihood to work than male students. And this gap shr um, shrinks a little bit as they um, grow older. And um, also uh, for both male and female students, they're more likely to work when they're older. Um, another finding, which is only one sentence from one simple variable, but we think it's an important finding to note, that is about 40% of students in year 2022 reported that they had been in the same job for more than one year. That is to say um, that um, for a large, for a sizable proportion of students, work is not something that is changing all the time. It lasts for only a couple of months per referral in their life, but instead it's, um, it's a sustained and important um, part of their life. And um, coming to working hour distributions, so, um, so we are breaking all the working students into groups in terms of how long they work in a week. Um, we can see that, so it's quite small here, but the, uh, the bar on the left for each panel is for female students, and the bar on the right, um, the, the right bar for each panel is for the male students. And um, it goes from 2010, 2015, 19 to 22. So consistently, we have more, a larger share of female stu students working than male students. And then breaking them down into smaller groups working different hours, we can see that most students actually work relatively low hours. Um, so smaller than, uh, so, um, shorter than eight hours, between eight and um, 16 hours. But um, when, we when we connect this um, distribution to the days of working they reported in the survey, and we found that just under 50% of students work for three or more days every week. So they don't work for very long hours, but they work consistently um, quite a few days in a week. And so from employment rate to working hours, now we're looking at the wage, um, the pay that they receive. We found no significant wage gaps between genders, um, not across age groups or across the years, except for one, um, tw the, lar the oldest age group in 2019. So um, it seems that we are seeing something that is also found in the US um, many years ago that the younger the workers are, um, the more equal the women and men's pay. But we do know that pay inequality exists in people's later life between genders in, um, the, in the formal adult labor market. So we want, therefore, we would like to investigate the pay differences between genders, um, also from the lens of gender segre uh, occupational segregation. So this is um, what I mentioned, that we divided all the occupations into four groups in, uh, in terms of their gender compositions. And here is the proportion of male and female students among different kinds of occupations. Um, across age groups. So this is for year 2022. On um, the upper right, upper left corner is the distribution for the age group 16 to, 14, uh, to 17. And then we move to the right, it's for the age group 18 to 20. And for the um, lower left corner, it's for the age group 21 to 22. And the last, um, the last, chart is for age group 23 to 29. So 
a couple of things evident from this graph. First one, a lot of students are in integrated occupations. So they are in those occupations that are not dominant by one gender. And this is more of the case for younger students. As we move across age groups, we can see that students start to divert to more gender dominant groups. And the last um, finding from this chart is that the little uh, purple bar for small group occupation increased as, um, as, as we move across age group from the youngest to the oldest. So as, as we are talking about older students, um, the, the occupations that they work in get more diverse, um, given that we, the small group occupation only has one or two people in it. So an increase in this share bar actually means the, uh, an explosion of, in numbers of small group occupations that students are working at. And, and to um, look at it more, um, more systematically, we chose those occupations with, um, with large group sizes, and we want to see the gender wage ratio between men and women among some more sizable, um, unprofessional occupations. So the ratio here is, is calculated by um, weighted mean hour pay for men divided by weighted mean hour pay for women. How to interpret this chart? Um, so the horizontal line in the middle at 1.0 means that men and women have their payment at, par at parity, so about similar level, which lines consistently with the blue lines. The two blue lines are for two integrated occupations, that is sales assistants and retail cashiers, elementary personal service occupations. So students working in these two occupations across the five um, years, they receive about the same payments between a man and women. The points beyond, above the 1.0 horizontal line indicates a male pay advantage. That is, in this occupation, uh, male students are more than female students. And that lines consistently with the two green lines for the two male dominant occupation um, that is um, elementary storage, uh, storage occupation, agricultural and related trades. Um, similarly, below the 1.0 horizontal line indicates a female earning advantage. Um, that is uh, roughly the data points for female um, dominant occupation across the five years. So this, um, this is not a very robust finding because we don't have very large group size uh, in terms of payment uh, pay and hourly pay information. Um, but it is a suggestive finding that students might have this incentive to move to more gender dominant occupations in terms of getting better paid. And to look at it from um, a more general perspective, among the top, uh, the lowest um, paid 10 occupations, six of them are integrated. Um, and we can see an overlap between these two tables. The first one is on, um, is it lowest hourly pay? And the second one is occup 10 occupations with smallest gender pay gaps. We see an overlap between two um, occupations. Um, sales and retail assistance and other elementary service occupations. And these are two most clustered occupations that have largest group size and they are, they are offering the lowest pay, one of the lowest pays to students, uh, which is lower than the mi minimum wage level and also they have the smallest earning disparities between genders. Therefore, this graph which shows that there's no significant wage gap between female and male students is actually a, largely an artifact driven by a lot of students engaged in lowest paid um, occupations and because the payment for both genders are so low it's not 
even um, meaningful to discuss it from a gender perspective. And then we use a label for survey data to look at where these, where, what rich sectors do these students working in these lowest paid occupations working at. So mainly they are active in res restaurant, food service, beverage, retail, accommodation. Um, so all these elementary service and sales sectors. So, all, so although that only around three or four percent of the whole labor force are students, students make up about one fifth of the labor force in among all sales assistants, cashiers, elementary service occupations. To conclude, we are seeing a double burden faced by students who are working, in, um, who are working today. They are engaged in work with very low paid nature, and at the same time, they are experiencing gender patterns in the labor market. So a large share of students are working in a couple of integrated, gender neutral um, occupations, both low paid, but at the same time, have high levels of gender equity. Um, so this, um, this leads to this arti artifact that there's no overall gender inequality in terms of pay gaps among students. Older students, they are more likely to work in more gender segregated occupations and some of these offer gender pay advantages to students um, for sex typical employment. Women are more likely than men to work while studying and this has been consistent over time across age groups and especially prevalent among school age students. So for many students who are working while studying, um, employment is actually a long-term regular activity and a quite important part of their life. Thank you very much. <laughs>